Hello, everybody. Ed Yardeni here. Uh, nice to be with you. I'm glad you could join me. Well, um, lots of interesting things to, to discuss. Uh, on a personal note here, um, uh, we've uh, had a nice family reunion here. Uh, all uh, five of my kids uh, came over to the house here in Long Island and uh, a couple of uh, son-in-laws, uh, my mother-in-law, my wife, of course, uh, and uh, our uh, three dogs. I, I hope I'm not leaving anybody out. Uh, but uh, most of us spent uh, the uh, lockdowns together and we got along famously well. So here it is, uh, April 17th, and uh, it's three years after the lockdowns, uh, March, April lockdowns, and uh, we're doing some reminiscing about uh, uh, what it was like back then and uh, how um, the pandemic uh, has affected uh, all of us in one way or another. It uh, kind of dawns on me that uh, the pandemic uh, also has had a tremendous effect on the economy, on inflation, on fiscal and monetary policies. I think sometimes we lose sight of that. You know, we get so much into the kind of textbook macroeconomics that we forget that uh, a, uh, something major happened. You know, I, I did take econometrics in, uh, in graduate school. I failed it uh, the first time around, had to stick around for a summer and then got an honors in it. And I swore that I'd never use it again. Uh, but uh, I remember something in there called dummy variables. When you do these regression analyses, you, you put in a variable for a, a kind of a one-time event to make sure it doesn't throw off the statistical relevance of the other relationships uh, between the uh, dependent variables and the so-called independent variables. Well, the pandemic certainly uh, has to be a dummy variable in anybody's equation. Uh, it was a shocker, it was a one-time thing, hopefully. Uh, at least in the realm of history, it seems to occur every now and then, not, not on a frequent basis. Uh, looks like we got through it, but it was a shock and it's had lots, lots, lots of shock effects. Uh, the economy has been on uh, steroid and speed uh, ever since. We had a uh, terrible recession back in uh, uh, March and April of 2020, uh, and it lasted all of two months. It was a terrible recession, lasted all of two months. Uh, then we had a remarkable V-shaped recovery. There's some controversy about whether it was going to be V-shaped or not. We felt it would be V-shaped, and so it was. Um, and uh, then uh, before you, you know it, uh, we uh, had an inflation surge. Uh, and I think a lot of that was pandemic related. Uh, you know, I know that the Fed gave up on the idea that uh, inflation has been transitory, but I think it definitely has been transitory when it uh, comes to uh, the uh, relationship of uh, goods inflation to the economy. Uh, clearly, the pandemic uh, caused uh, excessively stimulative com an ex excessively stimulative combination of fiscal and monetary policies, and that was, of course, uh, what uh, got inflation going. It uh, created a demand shock that uh, was mostly satisfied on the goods side, and then couldn't be because uh, everything got jammed in the ports, creating a tremendous inflation. But we've had a the past two years, a dramatic round trip in uh, goods inflation and services inflation that's been persistent. And part of that is because we've got this 50% uh, of services excluding energy, core services, is uh, rents and rent inflation, the way it's measured, uh, doesn't reflect uh, current rents. And we do know that the way things are going, it's very likely that uh, rent inflation will moderate significantly in the second half of the year uh, in the CPI and the PCED deflator. So in the grand scheme of uh, time and economic history, uh, it may very well turn out to be that uh, this inflation experience has been uh, fairly uh, trans transitory. I know that there's a lot of people who believe that that's not the case, uh, but I, I think that's uh, likely to be the case. And uh, I think the outlook for the economy remains uh, fairly upbeat. I, I don't see a, uh, a recession uh, coming up, and I do think that inflation's uh, going to moderate. Let's look at a few things here that uh, I wanted to share with you this morning. Uh, let's look at, um, let's share the screen. And uh, this morning uh, we had uh, the New York Fed released its um, business survey for, uh, for April. This is really one of the most real-time indicators we have of the, of the economy. It, uh, it, it's come out for, for April already and um, it tends to be volatile. Uh, and we tend to wait uh, for the Philadelphia survey, which is going to come out on Thursday, and we average them together. And they still are relatively volatile, but they tend to be very good 
uh, indicators of the other three uh, surveys that uh, come out. Altogether, there's five business surveys that uh, the various uh, Federal Reserve banks uh, conduct. And uh, so I think we are already looking at uh, a possibility that the regional business surveys based just on New York uh, might very well signal that uh, we're bottoming in these uh, surveys. Uh, why is that important? Well, these surveys collectively are very highly correlated with the uh, manufacturing uh, PMI. And so that would augur for uh, an improvement in the uh, uh, PMI for, for April, which comes out in, in early May. And it would be another indicator that uh, we, we have in fact been going through a rolling recession, a rolling recession that hit housing at the beginning of, uh, of, the recession, of this rolling recession, the beginning of last year. Uh, then it uh, continued to hit housing, but then it also started to hit goods because uh, the consumers bought everything they wanted. And when the uh, merchandiser was stuck in the LA ports uh, finally got delivered, they didn't really want more of that. And so we had a, a fairly uh, conventional uh, goods recession where inventories uh, built up involuntarily and uh, companies had to, retailers had to discount the prices in order to uh, get rid of the, the merchandise. Meanwhile, we're also potentially seeing a bottom in the housing market, not necessarily a V-shaped recovery, but at least a, a bottom there. So that's uh, something to, uh, to factor in thinking about the, the economy. Uh, and uh, so as you can see, this is the general business conditions index. It had a nice uh, jump uh, to, to, the, to the upside. This is the new orders index, which is phenomenally strong. Uh, delivery times, it's kind of like what Chauncey Gardner said uh, in being there, the movie and the book, uh, in the spring there will be growth. And it certainly looks like in the spring there's growth in, in, in the New York area. Uh, delivery times uh, picked up some. Uh, employment uh, and the work week remained on the weak side. Uh, again, this tends to be manufacturing related. So this could be actually a good signal for uh, a rebound in productivity, which is what I'm counting on to revive, uh, the, to keep the consumer going. Wages rising faster than prices can only happen consistently if productivity is making a comeback. Uh, inventories, nothing special there other than they, they're increasing. Maybe that's voluntary now. Uh, and then the uh, prices uh, uh, paid and the prices received uh, indexes, uh, not a whole lot of progress uh, relative to the past few months, but we have come down from, from their peak. So uh, you know, that's nothing to get excited about on the inflation front, but it's, it's better than seeing that these numbers go up. Let's now uh, go over to the, the morning briefing and take a look. Uh, the morning briefing is dedicated to discussing the views of Jamie Dimon and Christopher Waller. Uh, Jamie Dimon, of course, is the uh, head of uh, JP Morgan. JP Morgan just reported on Friday a remarkably strong uh, earnings, which kind of makes you scratch your head. What was Jamie Dimon getting all alarmist about all this time? And suddenly he's reporting these phenomenal earnings. Uh, interest income is, is up. Um, and uh, they've obviously taken some, some allowances for losses, but nothing that, uh, that, that really uh, chipped into their uh, surprisingly strong earnings. Uh, and during the call, they were saying that uh, the economy looks pretty good right now. Consumer looks pretty good right now. But as you know, since last summer, uh, Jamie Dimon's been saying a hurricane's coming. Uh, if uh, You better watch out. The bank is kind of hunkering down. I, I guess the lesson is that if everybody expects a recession, then everybody's going to behave themselves. And maybe we don't get a recession. Maybe we don't get the kind of excesses that typically have to be uh, unwound and re reversed. And again, this is very consistent with the rolling recession ID. Uh, so uh, it's just a shame that uh, uh, a, a person as uh, influential, as knowledgeable, as uh, uh, vocal, uh, that gets uh, so much uh, airtime, uh, basically uh, pre presented a pretty dour outlook since last summer. And uh, I know some of our accounts asked me about that and said, what do I think about it? It's one of the, re it's one of the things they factored in for uh, their, their concerns on the bearish side. And so they needed me to give him some uh, reasons why uh, he might be wrong or what offsetting positives might be. Uh, as you know, we do have a uh, optimistic bias, but we try to be balanced. And we always can tell you the, the, the pessimistic story if we had to and kind of depress you and get you to sell everything if, uh, if, if we really wanted to. Uh, and I, I respect your uh, 
judgment better than that. So you'll probably conclude I just something's off the rails uh, with the Ardeni. Uh, but anyways, uh, you know, some people might very well have sold their positions. And just on Friday, uh, JP Morgan stock was up uh, 7%. Great for Jamie Dimon. I doubt that he sold uh, beforehand. But uh, anyways, let's look at uh, figure one. That's the diversified banks. Look, they're still down. They're down like over 20% from their uh, record highs. If you look at this uh, S&P 500 diversified bank index, uh, it includes the, the, the major, uh, the banks, uh, the, the, the four, the five major ones. And you can see that it is, has come down uh, uh, quite a bit, uh, but that was an, a nice little bounce there on Friday and could very well be the beginning of uh, better times for the banks. As you know, we've liked the financials for a while. Uh, and when they took this kind of dive, uh, much to our chagrin, uh, we concluded that we liked them here. We still like them. And uh, uh, I, th I think the uh, announcement from these banks uh, kind of lends us lends some support to at least some optimism on the financial uh, sector. Uh, this is the uh, Blue Angels uh, for the uh, diversified banks. And you can see that uh, the, the forward earnings have actually held up reasonably well here, uh, even though Jamie's been talking everything down since last summer. And when you multiply these by PEs of 8, 12, 16, you can see that the PEs dropped from about 12 back in early last year to something like 8. So 8 kind of looks like a pretty good buying point when you look at the, the history of um, the Blue Angels here. Uh, this was a good buying point, 8 uh, forward PE here, uh, pretty close to that here, here for sure. So that's something to, to consider. Now, the other uh, question, of course, is the... Uh, banking crisis. And uh, as uh, my, my mantra has been, uh, any day that uh, nothing's blowing up uh, in the banking sector is a good day uh, for, for all of us and, and, and for the stock market, because there has uh, been fear that this could be the beginning of a credit crunch. Uh, as you know, I've been telling the uh, yield curve story as follows, that uh, whenever the yield curve inverts, that tends to be a pretty good predictor that if the Fed continues to raise interest rates, something will break in the financial system and that that in turn could very well become an economy-wide credit crunch, which then causes a recession. Uh, so, so far the process is, so, is working. The inverted yield curve has accurately predicted that something will break. In this case, there was a couple, couple of big banks and a concern about uh, bank runs, uh, but the Fed came in very, very quickly. Uh, March 10th, uh, SVB imploded. March 12th is Sunday over the weekend. They came up with this the bank liquidity facility. It's basically a one-year discount window uh, facility. And I think that calmed things down pretty, pretty quietly, but uh, pretty rapidly. But let's see uh, what the data shows. You know, we're very dependent uh, on data just the way the Fed is. Uh, so here's bank credit. And you can see that there was actually an increase after uh, two uh, weekly decreases. Uh, here's the securities component of bank credit up quite a bit. Uh, the uh, loans and leases component was was up uh, somewhat. It wasn't a big number, but at least it beats uh, these uh, declines here. Some of this data that we're having for the past four weeks, of course, <clears throat> is affected by uh, the uh, failure of a relatively big bank like SVB uh, and, and Sovereign. So uh, uh, the, the, these kind of uh, created some skewness in this data because they don't reflect the entire banking system having these kind of problems, but uh, maybe just a couple. Uh, but then uh, deposits, uh, encouraging to see that deposits uh, have been up after a, a few months of uh, declines. And that means that uh, uh, the dependence on borrowings by the banks uh, has uh, turned negative. They don't need to borrow, so they've been paying down their borrowings. Uh, borrowings is a level, it's not a, a flow. And as you can see, uh, the level of borrowings uh, surged here, and that clearly reflected those two banks uh, needing to uh, uh, borrow. The FDIC, when it uh, took over those two banks, um, basically uh, had to borrow from the Fed uh, to uh, shore up uh, the uh, entities that they had acquired uh, with the FDIC uh, basically guaranteeing uh, rep repayment. Uh, now, the, the real issue uh, within that that we have to make sure we don't uh, forget is small banks. Uh, the large banks are the 25 largest banks in the country. Everything else is viewed as a small bank, uh, whether it be regional, uh, a regional bank or a community bank. 
And as you can see, uh, let's let's look uh, to see whether there's massive outflows out of the uh, smaller banks, uh, which then creates problems for these banks to lend uh, to uh, local developers. And so that creates the uh, concerns about the commercial real estate market, for example. They, they are the biggest lenders uh, in the commercial real estate uh, market. Uh, but you can see bank credit edged up a little bit, which again, isn't great, but it beats uh, two, two weekly declines. You can see securities edged up, loans edged up, uh, deposits uh, rose a little bit more than edged up, but not, not a heck of a lot, but again, better than the kind of outflows we saw here. And this may very well be just a couple of, uh, of, the, of the banks that have gotten themselves into trouble. And uh, so this is almost like a mirror image, right? Uh, when they uh, have a deposit outflow, they uh, turn to the Fed to assure them up. And that's what happened here. Uh, now they're less dependent on borrowing. And uh, so um, the because the deposits have, have come in. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Jamie took uh, $2 billion in uh, allowances for losses uh, during the first quarter. Uh, we looked at the uh, weekly data that comes out with this uh, uh, release that shows us other data. Uh, it's the uh, H.8 H8 uh, release that comes out every week on, uh, on Fridays at 4.15, kind of ruined our uh, start to, our, uh, to the weekend. Uh, but that's okay, I enjoy this, uh, what, what I'm doing. And what we're seeing here is that uh, for all banks, allowances for uh, losses increased by $10 billion uh, since uh, the, the uh, beginning of the first quarter. Uh, so it uh, shows that the banks are having some stress here, but uh, nothing like uh, what we saw back uh, back here for all the banks. Uh, I guess uh, this, this is what we have available in data. Uh, this is the large banks, and you can see they were really stressed out here, uh, not, not so much um, uh, currently. I mean, clearly this could always go like that if we have a repeat or uh, even a minor version of the great financial crisis, uh, but that's not the story we're telling. Uh, then on uh, Thursdays at 4.15, there's another release called the H41, and the H41 uh, shows the Fed's balance sheet. So it's just another way to see from the Fed's perspective uh, what, what they're lending out to, to the banks. And uh, the other credit extension went from zero uh, to uh, $173 billion, and that was because of those uh, two banks uh, that were uh, taken over by the uh, FDIC. The primary credit, uh, which is basically the, the, uh, the old fashioned discount window, uh, jumped up uh, uh, in the two weeks in, into the crisis. And now it's come down sub substantially down to uh, 67.9 billion. And the bank term funding pr program, which is essentially a one year version of the discount window, uh, that's uh, 76.7 billion. So I think these uh, facilities uh, have been working uh, to calm things down. Uh, now, uh, Fed uh, Chair uh, Christopher Waller gave a speech on Friday. Uh, Fed, sorry, Fed Governor uh, Waller. I promoted him. Fed Governor Waller gave a speech on Friday. It was pretty hawkish. It was very hawkish. Uh, he basically said that uh, he doesn't see that inflation. We've made any progress on bringing inflation down uh, uh, for the past year and uh, said that uh, we need to continue to raise interest rates to, to bring interest rates uh, down. Uh, he was uh, very uh, laid back about the economy. The economy looks uh, pretty good. He was pretty laid back about the banking crisis. He said, so far, it looks as though uh, the uh, facilities, the measures that the Fed has taken uh, are, are working. Uh, and so uh, being sort of uh, calm about those two areas, uh, he raised, uh, he, he remained an alarmist on the um, on the inflation front, it's kind of ironic. You got Diamond being an alarmist on the economic front, uh, talking about hurricanes. Well, maybe it's not going to be hurricane anymore. Uh, he's still talking about storms using the weather analogy. Uh, but Waller is very much an alarmist on the inflation front, and he said we've really made no progress. Uh, let me show you what he means by that exactly. And you know, I mean, what, what's what's his basis for saying that? And what he's uh, looking at is the uh, CPI. Uh, excluding food and energy. So it's the core CPI, as you can see here. And the core CPI arguably really hasn't made much progress. It's been kind of stuck around here. Um, by the way, this chart, I, I suggested that the Fed officials who are just 
fixated on the CPI and the consumption deflator should also have a look at the PPI. The PPI was uh, expanded a few years ago. Uh, it used to be just uh, for goods. Now it's for goods and services. And so it tends to be actually a pretty interesting uh, leading indicator for the uh, uh, consumer uh, measures of inflation. And as you can see here, this is the PPI. For, they actually have something called personal consumption X food and energy for PPI. People aren't used to, don't know about this because they're used to thinking about PPI just kind of being you know, crude goods and immediate goods and basically being goods. And they don't realize that it's uh, include services and that uh, there is even an item called personal consumption X food and energy uh, what's interesting about it is it doesn't include rent, which kind of makes makes sense in, in, in some ways. Uh, and you can see that uh, that inflation rate certainly has come down pretty dramatically. To say we've made no progress is just to kind of be a stickler and just be sticking to this one indicator, which may very well be about to take, take a dive based on the, the PPI. Let's look at a couple more inflation indicators here. So again, he says we made no progress. Well, take a look at this chart. I mean... Uh, it turns out that goods inflation has turned out to be totally transitory. In one, in two years, it's gone basically from uh, zero or you know a little bit above zero, uh, went straight up to something in the neighborhood of 13 percent. This is core uh, consumer price index, and then for goods, and then it's uh, come right back down to 1.5 percent. 1.5 percent. So I think that's uh, disinflation, significant disinflation. That's very transitory. Uh, again, all the stuff that was stuck at the ports couldn't get delivered, so they raised the prices on all the goods. And when the goods finally arrived, consumers are already satisfied all their demand. And down, tumbling down comes uh, inflation on the good side. So the problem has been that the improvement on the good side has been offset by uh, continued more persistent inflation on the um, uh, services side. And uh, while the Fed has uh, said, well, let's not look at housing, let's look at other areas of services, I'm saying, let's look at both. And rent inflation has uh, been a laggard. Uh, it's got, uh, it reflects uh, leases outstanding, uh, rentals on, uh, rent, rental rates on outstanding leases. Uh, but we know that uh, the market uh, rate on leases has come down rather substantially. And so this, I think, is going to be coming down. Uh, and if it does, then uh, the second half of the year, I think we could be looking at 3 to 4% on the consumption deflator, which is right now running around 5%. Uh, here's another uh, picture of uh, rent inflation. And you can see we show the year over year, which uh, looks like it's topping out. Uh, and uh, when you look at the three month, not surprisingly, since this is topping out, the underlying three month inflation rate uh, has, uh, looks like it's, it's coming down, it's coming down. We'll, we'll see what happens in the next few months, but uh, we think this is gonna be fairly symmetrical as, as these inflation numbers tend to be. Uh, look at the PPI final demand. Uh, this includes everything. So it's uh, not just consumption, it's business demand, the whole thing. So uh, again, there's certainly been tremendous progress in goods inflation, uh, in services inflation, uh, and in overall PPI inflation. Uh, another cut here, uh, this is uh, personal consumption. Again, for the PVI as a personal consumption measure, it does not include rent. Uh, and let's compare that to the PCED and the CPI. Uh, this is now uh, headline inflation rates. And you can see that uh, the PPI is pretty, uh, uh, pretty good, it's promising. It's promising, uh, it's down to 2.7%. Uh, February PCED was five and CPI was five. And I think they're, they're, they're coming down. Uh, I think we, oh, this is personal consumption expenditures on services. And again, this is the PPI. So excluding rent, there seems to be a lot of, inf of inflation uh, that uh, is coming down in the PPI measure for personal consumption of services. This reflects not the prices that consumers are paying. It reflects the prices that companies that sell to consumers are receiving. I don't know if that, I doubt that makes a big difference but at least I wanted you to, uh, to, to understand that. So uh, having covered quite a bit of uh, terrain here, let's uh, stop sharing and let's start uh, having a little discussion here. Uh, Anonymous, what is your prediction for the gold price from here? Look, I've said before, uh, don't come to me on gold. Uh, 
I'm an old fashioned strategist. I need uh, dividends, I need interest, I need some sort of income uh, to, to uh, come up with a uh, valuation measure. Uh, I was observing that uh, the price of gold was very tightly uh, inversely correlated with the tip seal, but even that relationship's not working anymore. So I've kind of lost my, my, my bearings here. Uh, another thought I've had is that uh, gold seems to uh, give you an indication of the underlying trend in commodity prices. And maybe that's what's going on here. Maybe gold is saying that, uh, you know, uh, all this pessimism from the World Bank, the IMF, and uh, the nadering nabobs of negativ negativity, as I like to call them, all the pessimists, uh, maybe they're totally wrong. And uh, the global economy is uh, really about to pick up steam here, and that will uh, lead to higher commodity prices. So uh, I don't really have a problem with that, uh, since I do think that uh, I, I'm not in the uh, recession camp, either on a domestic or a global basis. So maybe that's what gold is, is telling us. Um, from a supply demand perspective, I don't keep on top of that situation. I know there's a lot of talk about uh, some central banks uh, have decided that uh, they want off the dollar standard and they're going to try to create some other standards uh, and they're buying gold. So maybe that's that's some of it. But we've had this kind of talk for many years in the past where the dollar was uh, not going to be uh, a reserve currency anymore. And um, I, uh, I I don't I don't buy it. Okay, Willem, uh, the Fed's favorite inflation gauge, the core PCED has shown at best constant inflation since the end of last year. What makes you so confident inflation is coming down materially for the rest of this year? Is it, is it rent inflation? <laughs> Short answer is yes. It's uh, rent inflation because the uh, consumer, I, I, you know, we basically just covered it. So I know you were one of the first questions uh, before I got into this. So I, I think I covered that. You let me know if that's not the case. Um, but the answer is yes, uh, rent inflation. Uh, Tim, uh, purely hypothetical, but would the US be in a better situation now if we didn't bail out the economy back in 2008, 2009? In other words, uh, let capitalism work. Yeah, I'm always in favor of letting capitalism work. And I think uh, with the benefit of hindsight, and even at the time, I, I didn't really think QE2 made any sense. QE1 was a liquidity uh, pr providing emergency measure and, and it, it worked fine. And uh, that should have been the end of it. Um, when uh, the Fed came up with QE2 in uh, 2010, I think it was the summer of 2010, they said, look, folks, we've run our econometric model, and our econometric model says that the Fed funds rate should be minus 75 basis points. Fortunately, they weren't in the mindset of actually lowering it to minus 75 basis points the way the ECB went and the, BO uh, and the BOJ. But they said, you know, our model says we can approximate that kind of easing by buying 600 a billion dollars worth of uh, securities. And so that was the justification. Notice that we haven't seen them mention their econometric model at all. I mean, it can be interesting to see what their econometric model is saying that a banking crisis might be equivalent to in terms of raising the Fed funds rate, uh, as an example. It might be very interesting to know what is QT, quantitative tightening, equivalent to in terms of uh, uh, Fed, Fed funds uh, rate tightening. Uh, doesn't uh, a banking crisis like the one we've just seen with a potential participant remediation prove that 5% is restrictive enough so that they don't have to raise interest rates anymore. That's my view. Um, but that was kind of squashed by uh, Waller's uh, speech on, uh, on, on Friday, but, uh, and he is a governor, so he's a voter, uh, but we'll see the extent to which, I mean, there could be some real uh, debating and discussions going on at this next uh, FOMC meeting, and there may, may actually be a dissent or two. Uh, as you know, Goolsby's uh, been arguing that uh, maybe we've done enough and we should just uh, le leave it alone. Okay, uh, Paul, uh, good morning, Ed. Uh, good morning. Speaking of Jamie Dimon, uh, should not the, the press be challenging his alarmist comments or do you think they were calculated in that, as you just said, everyone behaved, behaved themselves? Uh, folks like Jamie should be very cautious when making statements given his position of authority yeah, I mean, that's really uh, my, my view is, uh, you know, thanks, uh, thanks, but no thanks. I mean, if he really had some real grounds, because uh, he is an insider, he knows what the economy is doing uh, based, based on things, but he was being an economist. He was forecasting. Even last summer, he was saying everything looks pretty good right now, but uh, when uh, we, the consumer runs out of excess saving, uh, that's when we're going to see uh, a recession. 
And it's not really his job to, uh, to, to forecast. It's his, if he wants to tell us you know, how things are right now, he could have just said things are looking okay, but you know, we're managing things uh, just in case they don't go okay, since other people are talking about a recession. Uh, but he uh, lent uh, credibility uh, to the recession story. And uh, uh, I think he actually probably got uh, some uh, innocent bystanders to get out of the market. Uh, not a particularly good time. Uh, there was a, uh, the June low was retested in October and uh, it went below that the June low, but not by much, I think two, 3%. And the October 12th low was the low, in my opinion, uh, in, the, in the market. And a lot of people were might have been left behind because of somebody as credible as uh, Jamie Dimon kind of uh, shoot, shooting off uh, the, the hip or at the mouth or whatever you want to call it. Um, S. Goldman, uh, as it relates to the banking crisis, uh, shouldn't the moderation in interest rates materially improve the mark to market on banks, treasury bond portfolios? Uh, I've not seen any commentary on this. Yeah, I think that's a very good point. Uh, uh, there has been uh, a lot of angst about the uh, uh, held to maturity securities that uh, uh, have uh, large losses if they had to be sold right now. And uh, it's kind of uh, interesting. There was a big uh, mark to market uh, issue. Uh, I, I was, I think, at, at near the forefront of that uh, argument, arguing that uh, uh, marking to market in a financial crisis doesn't make a hell of a lot of sense and that there should be more held to maturity and that that would have uh, moderated the, uh, the the crisis. But uh, I think we're sort of in the same situation now, but this time around, uh, we do have health to maturity and uh, these uh, losses are not being booked and uh, uh, they won't be booked uh, as long as the securities can be held to maturity. Uh, but then again, as you said, uh, we've had a nice little rally here, uh, but don't forget a lot of these securities were bought when interest rates were close to zero. So they still have some substantial losses. This hasn't just kind of, made that problem all totally go away. Uh, but it is uh, sort of an interesting regulator on keeping the Fed from raising interest rates much more because uh, the banks are facing disintermediation. They are being forced to raise their uh, uh, deposit rates. And uh, while the big banks may be able to uh, offset that, I'm not sure that the smaller banks will be able to, and that'll be squeeze their profitability. Uh, but my solution to the banking crisis is the small banking crisis. Uh, or the banking crisis of small banks uh, is that there'll be a lot of M&A activity. So we'll go from uh, which bank do, should I sell uh, to which bank should I buy because it's in trouble and it's going to have to be acquired. Um, oh, we've kind of run out of time here. Uh, let me uh, jump here to Anurag. Uh, approximately what fraction of a bank loan, bank's loan book is in commitment in commercial real estate, money center versus regional what fraction of a bank's loan portfolio is not... Okay, so uh, Anurag, uh, we've uh, got a... Uh, let's uh, see if I can share real quickly here. Yeah, if we go to the, to the website and uh, go to the main page. So if you go all the way down here to uh, Global Money and Credit, there's something uh, uh, called here U.S. Uh, Money and Credit. And then we've got our commercial bank book there. So have a look at that, and uh, let me see if I can get you a quick reference here. Uh, yeah, this uh, this shows a small banks as a percent of total banks uh, by by the loan categories, and uh, the the um, total banks um, commercial real estate is sixty seven percent. That's the one that people usually are focused on. Uh, so take a look at uh, charts uh, ten. Well, 10 is really the one, but uh, even before that, we, we have uh, a bunch that, uh, and again, we update this every single week. Uh, we figured uh, we'll all be watching the bank data on a weekly basis for a while. Well, thanks everybody for joining us. Have, have a great week and uh, we'll see you next week.